So we left off last week in terms of the connections to the spelling. Um, and I realized I do need to do a unit on spelling. So I will tweak the syllabus a little bit and add in spelling later on in the year. Um, we got to check. Basically, you're working on the alphabetic principle in kindergarten and first grade. At the start of the second half of the year in first graders, students are really learning how to read. I find this reality check changing based on the Common Core State Standards. We expect students in kindergarten to be reading by the end of the year. So that's a huge shift in the way that we teach. If you look at the first appendix of the Common Core State Standards. So what is phonics is a quick review and why do we teach it? Last week, what is phonics? Can't answer this question. I probably wouldn't bother showing up for the test. What is phonics? Seeing and hearing. What? Seeing and hearing. Seeing and hearing is the layman's definition. Yes, that, that will work. Do we have a professional definition? Letter and sound correspondence. Letter and sound correspondence, yes. Both of those would work. That would probably get you half credit. That would get you full credit, even though they say the same thing. Can we get even more scientific? I use two kind of big words. Seeing and graphing correspondence. Yep, which is saying the same thing that Peter said, the same same thing that Rebecca said, but just using more two cent words, which just makes you sound smarter to say the same thing. Really, that's the definition of intelligence: using big words to explain things that everybody else already knows. Um, that's what it means. Yeah, if you look up intelligence, that's what it says. Using big words to explain things that everybody already knows. Um, and we teach phonics because it is a great predictor of their performance. And it's like, that's how you read. You break up words. You have to be able to break up words. And, you know, you have to be able to know that there's a letter and sound correspondence. When you're assessing phonics at the classroom level, not using kind of a a test, which is looking at student work products to assess phonics. This is where I look at their orthographic knowledge, their spelling, to kind of get an idea of what they can do and what they need to learn. Okay. You can look for clues there. We will go over more formal phonics assessments um, in a little bit. But orthographic knowledge tells you a lot about students' skills with Fox. So, for example, October in a kindergarten classroom. Here is a Tyrannosaurus Rex. What does a student know? And what do you think they know? Turn and talk. Yep. What does a student know? And what do you think they know? Need to know. It's October in a kindergarten right now. What were some of the ideas? Vowels, okay. They definitely have some concept of alphabet principle. Yeah, they have the beginning and sound. Uppercase letter formation. There's at least some letter sounds. They can syllables level segmentation. Let's go back and look. Transfer, you know, Rex. So they. They add like the transverse, they, they have some basic syllable. They're breaking the word up into syllables. Tran, Saurus, Rex. Do they know lowercase letters? We don't know. Onset and rhyme segmentations? You said, yeah, they got the beginning sound, <coughs> in the, but they don't have that. I mean, should any kindergarten spell transverse Rex? No. But looking at how they spelled it gives you clues to what you need to work on with that student.
this is a student writing Humpty Dumpty sat in the wall. And I said, oh, and I made the O into a pumpkin. <laughs> Notice here, Kevin. And this is O. I made the O into a pumpkin right down there on the corner. We'll tell Kevin later there's no O on the wall, but that's okay. Kevin did a great job. So, what does Kevin know? What does Kevin need to know? Turn, talk, go. Yeah, you can go back. <laughs> well, he knows his uppercase letter formation. At least some letter sounds, because he has um, sat, kind of wall, he's trying to get there. His concepts about print might be slightly off, the words are, but notice the question mark, because he's still going left to right, but the sat on the wall is, that's just a kid not knowing how big to write. I mean, that's, that's normal, but that's why the question mark's there. So he wrote, Finn, you dot name working on your meant. And when the teacher asked them what they meant, this is the summer between kindergarten and first grade. Fine, you don't like my working. You always say, look at the mess you made. What do they know? What do they need to learn? See how they get a little bit harder? Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's a hard one. That short E rule, that's a tough rule to learn. Yes, ma'am? Punctuation. You don't have any kind of, but they're writing sentences going into first grade. They know full phonemic segmentation. They have some basic sight words. You, as, or at, the, mat, the, so they got you at the, so they do have some sight words that they've learned. Having some trouble with the preconsonantal nasal sounds and the long vowel markers, but that's normal. I, had a, I think that kid's right on track. Student so wrote, I like going <coughs> to the moves with my mom. September 1st grade. What do we know? What do we need to know? Yeah, they got the punctuation there. They got the capital letter there. Yeah, that's a good one. Upper and letter, they have sentence formation, high frequency words they know. The support with spacing is really what they need help with. So you can see how the connection between phonics and spelling is a tool in your teacher's chest to take out and really figure out what your students need help with. And these would make great test questions if I were to give you an illustration of the student's writing and say, what do you think the student knows? What do you think they should be able to do? Just throwing that out there. Um, now we're in October first grade. One's a boy named Davy Fitted. It is, he had gone and he. Once a boy named David. This, you also need to learn how to read. Let's do this. Once a boy named David had vines. Yeah, and he had a gun and a knife. And he was the kind of the king. He was the king of the wild frontier. Once there was a boy named David. I think it was about David Crockett, king of the wild frontier. Uh, 
So they have this story language. Once there's a boy, um, there was conventional spelling and invented spelling. It was easy to kind of interpret. took some time, but you can figure out what he was saying. Um, the ED morphine. You don't see Oh, hold on. Once was a boy named David. See the DE that he mixed up there? Um, and he had a gun and a knife, and he was the king of the wild frontier. And you can see that wild, like, wild, it's hard to hear that L in wild. That's almost like a pretty good inventive spelling for wild. I like horses the best. I like animals. I like Davy King the Wild Frontier better. Now they have full phonemic segmentation, some high frequency words. Now these are question marks, so we don't really know if they don't know that. So there's just these are just you would never use this as one piece of data to judge a student. But as a teacher, this is the kind of information you're using on a daily basis to build a relationship and knowledge of what your students know <coughs> and what they need to be able to do. I like to ski on the hill. I like green eggs and ham. Now we're in January of first grade. Good. I mean, those are the spacing's right, capitalization's right. So now they just need more varied level. Now you're bumping it up. Now you're getting out of five. And you're talking about sentence level combining and varying the sentences. They've obviously mastered the conventional spelling rules. Once my brother had a dream, we had a crab. We caught the crab that day. I hope it's caught and not beat. The same kind, that same night, the crab crawled on my brother's head, and he dreamed about the crab. He woke up and said, I dreamed about a crab. <laughs> Again, the story language is there. The K sound in the initial final position. Um, they're messing up their ED morphemes and low-frequency vowel patterns. Today at library, we talked about Cynthia Rylett. She had a real dog named Mudge. And she wrote about Henry and Mudge. A substitute came in and we read us a Henry and Mudge book. See that, that ED, you're seeing a common pattern. In first grade, kids are struggling with the ED morphine. What is a morpheme again? It can't stand on its own. That's, no, but some morphemes can. Oh. Yes, yeah, keep going, keep going. Smallest unit. That contains meaning. meaning. Monica, what you're mixing up is bound morphemes and free morphemes. Yeah, I was going ED is technically a bound morphine. It, it doesn't. ED means nothing on its own. Well, except my buddy Ed. Um, but it's bound. It needs another thing to, to have purpose. The diphthong in this one. Now, what's a diphthong again? What's the difference between a diphthong and a digraph? My uncle came on Saturday. He he was the kick the kick me champion or kickball champion. He juggled 585 times in a row. He was the best in the world back then. He really was. <laughs> Just on Saturday, you know, Sunday somebody else came and beat the kick me challenge. Punctuation. Look at it. I mean, it's over there. Open closed syllables. What is an open and closed syllable? What? What's a closed syllable? Mm -hmm. The final L blends and the K sound, the cuss sound he's struggling with. Let's go back and look.
Oh yeah, see the kickball champion, K C I C K. He's he's putting the K in front because he doesn't know which sound it is. The juggled, the J is backwards. The watercress seeds are pointing towards the window because it needs suns. We, son, we are going to be able to eat them at the end of school. So now they're doing some kind of like science report. So we're now we're in May, and they're actually using their writing to document their learning. They're not just learning to write. See the transition there? That the student's now using writing to document learning instead of just learning how to write. So how do we use this data to inform our instruction? Well, your core instruction needs to mirror your developmental sequence. We could see how we follow those kids, same group of kids, with that information from when they started kindergarten until they finished first grade in those examples. So you have to look at their assessments to, to figure out where they are developmentally and then build your, phonetic, your phonics instruction that way. And we can, we can accelerate our teaching for our readers. That's the kind of in-class assessment that you would use. Now, more formal <coughs> assessments look like this. This is this row mostly. This is the test of word reading efficacy. And it works two ways. You guys have these list of words, the score sheets on the last page. One more. I have given this test all the way up through a grade, and it works. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't tell you their comprehension. No, but just basically tells you how well they can break the code. It uses both sight words and nonsense words. So we're looking at the storing guide on page eight that you give to each other, and you're going to give this to each other. You have 45 seconds to basically say as many words as you can. Right? The first part is the word recognition. Those are sight words. How many of those words can they do in 45 seconds? The second form are nonsense words. I'm not going to have you guys give each other the sight words one because you'll, you should be able to finish all 45 or at least pretty close to that. <coughs> But what I want you to do is the nonsense words. Okay, now you'll read some longer lists of made-up words. The made-up words start out pretty easy, but they get harder as you go along. Read as many as them as you can until I tell you to stop. Begin here. I turn over the card, and you're going to read these words. So everybody read the practice words. Ready, go. Yeah. So now what I want you to do is, and we might have to spread out in the hallway a little bit, find a park, and what you do is on the back side, 
you mark, it tells you how it's correctly to be said and how, um, and you can do the stimulus word. You're going to give each other the nonsense word test. Have a little watch or your phone. Figure out what 45 seconds is about, approximately, especially with timers, even better. But we're just, we're just you know, you've got to get a taste of this, a little, a little taste. Go find a partner and do the nonsense words with them, okay? 45 seconds, you give them the list of words to say. They would take this, the one that starts with it. All right, go. Come back in like two or three minutes. You might need to spread out so you can hear. You go down the hallway. Yeah, then the app. Yeah, you can rip it off. Huh? So, for good phonics instructions, we start with that alphabetic principle. We look at the phonological awareness, that grounding in letters that we talked about in kindergarten, recognizing that first initial letter sound. Doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't, it's not driven by research. I mean research. It's not driven by worksheets. It's not driven by like phonics rules. It's about playing with words and sounds and making sound and letter connections, all right? And it does not have to be all of your instructions. Like I said, in early child education, I want high quality talk around the books and texts that you read in class and the center time where students get to apply language that they're learning to be the cornerstone of your classroom. And that's what we're going to get to see these groups do in a couple of weeks when you guys teach your phonics lessons. So it needs to look at words not just in isolation, but also in the stories. Not just in dictating or memorizing, but you need to use their inventive spelling, just like we practiced earlier. Their inventive spelling is key. And it will lead to automatic word recognition. That's why we use nonsense words to assess phonics. Because good phonics instruction leads to an automaticity. And it's just one part of your reading program. It's not the end all be all. How much time do we have? Left? Sorry, about 10 minutes left. Not of class, of the lecture. Again, systematic and explicit. I think I've defined that enough. You don't even have to write that down. I just want to reiterate that. Your phonics instruction needs to be systematic and explicit. So what did the National Reading Report panel say that kind of dictated our program? We know that tutoring in small group and whole class are effective. Most effective in kindergarten and first grade. After that, its efficacy declines dramatically and quickly. Yet, if you have ELL students, it doesn't mean you stop doing it. You would increase it. <clears throat> Phonics 
for the older students, third, fourth, fifth grade, and we do a lot of it in reading recovery. It's just we don't know that the results from the research are inconclusive. But we know that kindergartens and first graders, um, students with reading disabilities or English language learners, I even hate that, some, that sentence there, but that's ripped from the panel report, that it helps a lot. It improves their ability to read real words, pseudo words, and not so much the irregular words, because irregular words don't follow the patterns. So the, the correlation between phonics instruction and irregular words isn't as strong. However, in strong in phonics instruction does correlate well with the ability to read real words and pseudo words just like you practiced on the tower just now, or with the core phonics instruction system. Repeat. It improves spelling in kindergarten and first grade, but it does not improve spelling after that. Then you're talking about more orthographic word study. Once you get into the, into the more complex patterns of words, doesn't do much for students in terms of spelling, that spelling connection that we talked about last week. These statements, and I will upload this, will make great true-false kind of things. Just throwing that out there. When they looked at word recognition and compared it to basal programs, whole language, whole word, regular curriculum, the researchers in the National Reading Panel found it to be more effective. The effect size was, was greater than all other forms of the control group. Not the effect, oh yeah, the effect size. So that did more, so that's why they, they are really emphasizing it. But that's research. I mean, it's just, is it the phonics that is, is the phonics instruction that led to the greater gains, or is it, you know, different elements, causation, correlation kind of things? That, that's their, the conclusion of the National Reading Panel. Here's what we don't know. How long should phonics instruction be? How many years? How many minutes every day? How many letter and sound combinations should be taught, if at all? How do you make it not suck, is basically what question three asks. What's the role of teacher knowledge? Do you folks need to, like we make you in the state of Connecticut, and have to know what a diphthong, a digraph, a, um, a controlled R syllable do? If you know that, are you a better reading teacher? We make you take a test because we know that phonics instruction is more important, but we don't know if students who pass the test are better teachers of reading for numerous reasons. The main reason being that they do not release the pat your passing score, so we can't find out that information. They only tell you your score if you fail. And we don't get the score of the Reading Foundation's test if you pass, so we couldn't do a corollary study that looked at students that te te your test score on the Reading Foundation's test and students' reading ability over time. We, so we can't do that study on purpose, I think. They say it's because, Pearson says it's because they don't want you to, be, to say, that, oh, I'm a better reading teacher on a job interview because I got a 280 and she got a 260, or she got a 273. That's not the reason. The reason is they don't want us to be able to prove that the test is meaningless. <laughs> And then how should we teach it? Is you Are you folks sitting here um, being listening to a lecture, the best way to learn how to teach phonics? I don't think so. If I had my way, it'd be, every, well, if I had my way, all of um, teacher preparation would be way more clinical, and you'd be spending a lot more time in a school, and instead of me telling you about these tests, you would give tests, you would write up reports, you would work with kids for extended periods of time for the specific learning goals. 
If I was in charge of the world, I'm not yet. I ran for God. I lost by four votes. It was tough. Um, so we don't really know how we should be teachers should be trained um, to teach phonics. The, the, the National Reading Panel did not draw those conclusions. Some kinds of phonic instruction. When we look at synthetic phonics instruction, that's part the whole, starts with letter, sounds, and blend. That's that kind of developmental chart I've been showing you folks. The linguistic approach involves more reading. You can group words in the same patterns in the word families. So you're, you're using like the analogy of family. Um, you learn the letter sound associations needed to decode words in the text. I, I know. Part, I'm kind of the analytic phonics, and that's just where I kind of fall, and a little bit of that, you know, synthetic phonics instruction. Um, but that being said, if I'm reading a book and I see some great examples of, of where to teach it, I'm going to take advantage of it, or I'm going to have to put it into my center. Again, it always comes down to that thing: just don't make it suck, make it fun, and make sure that you're getting good data from your students, and it's developmentally appropriate. How do we go wrong? If you just rely on those teachable moments I was just talking about. If you're going to invent your curriculum as you go along, you pace inappropriately. So we look, think back to that, you know, progression. We, walk, we follow those kids from kindergarten to the end of first grade. You started doing the sentence combination at the first grade and the kindergarten level. Obviously, that's not going to work. You cannot ignore that developmental data. if you don't connect it to their actual reading and spelling, if it's just discrete. If you were to teach it all day long, or if you don't use the data to figure out where they are developmentally. I mean, if, you're, if you have no talent and no plan, you might as well just play for the Giants, um, because you'll end up with just a horrible record. So there isn't much hope there. You really need to have a formal plan Stop there. Okay.